Hey, what's going on YouTube? This is Kevin and Custom. Today I'm going to be taking you through my process to filament tune through Orca Slicer. Since my machine is going to be melting ASA, I'm going to heat up the chamber and make a coffee while I wait for it to get up to temp. In this video, I'm going to be melting some filament coming from What's Kraken. I ordered a few just so I could try them out. In these boxes, I'll have an ASA CF and the ASA. and then ABS. Now let's open up the Burnt Nebula because this is gonna be the filament that I use for tuning today. Check out what's cracking for any of those filaments shown. Now as I'm nearing the end of the heat soak, I'll perform a homing sequence to make sure that all axes are operational. It is worth noting that this Squid Ink Burnt Nebula ASA is of high purity and it is a requirement to dry it prior to use. These are the results after 18 hours at 70 degrees Celsius without tuning. Now let's get into it. Orca Slicer itself has a calibration that's built in. You can go ahead and check out the tutorial page for each of the tests as they do share a lot of data. Starting out, I'll make sure that both the printer as well as my build plate or bed type is accurate to what I'm using. And then I'll set a generic profile for whatever material I'm about to melt. In order to access the filament settings, select the edit button to the right of the generic material profile that you selected. You'll find that some of these presets need to be altered outside of calibration, including the bed temperature to meet what the manufacturer recommendation is. I know that 60C is a bit cold for this ASA. With the temperature tower, you'll select your material and it'll show you a range of temps that it is going to print at with a set five degrees Celsius step for each of the tests. What we're looking for here is overhangs, bridging, the surface quality, small prints, and the ability to go around various features. You'll be able to see the selection of temperatures clearly defined in the side so you can check and see what temperatures print best. And again, like I thought, 60 degrees Celsius was a bit cold and the print lost adhesion. So we're going to bump this up to 100 degrees C, which I believe it'll work well at. Saving that is our first setting. And although it did stick to the plate, the material does not like to print above 235 or below for that matter. With the completed temp tower, I'll check the overhangs to see which provides the best quality, as well as checking to see which bridging did the best. You're looking at the small prints like this spire inside to see if it's dimensionally accurate and you're also checking surface quality to see which temperature provides the best results. Your lowest temp will be up top and your highest temp will be at the bottom. With a quick inspection I was able to find that 255 degrees Celsius works best with this filament. I will perform a double check to make sure that the quality on this level exceeds the others and if I drop down to 250 there's going to be layer adhesion issues and at 260 they're still drooping in the bridging. 255 is going to be my pick. For the first layer I will put 260 because I want it hot to provide good adhesion but all other layers will be 255. The next step is to perform flow rate pass 1 to see if the flow needs to be either increased or decreased for this filament. 0.926 is going to be the foundation at which these calibrated values will be based off of. Taking a look at each of these calibration prints, the values are going to be attached at 20. It's going to be over extruding, causing ridges as the nozzle presses through the filament. And at negative 20, it's going to have gaps in between the lines as there's not enough extrusion. Zero is okay, it has a smooth surface, but I did see an imperfection. Negative five still had gaps in between the layer lines. By picking up number 5, I see that it has a smooth surface, but the outer perimeter has raised edges. Out of the two best options, you're always going to choose the higher one, as you will need to take flow rate 2 to get the final. The initial flow rate, you're going to multiply it by 100, and the modifier, which I chose as 5, and then divide by 100. My new value will be 0.9723, which I'll input and save at this time. Now it makes perfect sense to go the flow rate pass too, but my personal preference is to perform the pressure advance test to make sure that it is not affecting the results of that test. 
with a direct drive system. I never really exceed 0.04 with my filaments, so I set 0.01 to 0.04 with a 1,000th of a millimeter step. This will allow for me to check the corners to make sure that they're nice and crisp and there's nothing that would affect my visual inspection of flow rate pass two. As I look at the print, I will check all sides to make sure that the corners are going to provide equivalent results on each. Using a caliper and finding the appropriate measurement will help us find the appropriate value to input into our filament settings. If the corners are rounded out, it means the value is too low, whereas if they are wavy, it means the value is too high. So I will be in between both the top and the bottom, and I found that 16 millimeters provides the best results. I'll run my calipers around all sides to make sure that the results are equivalent on each of the corners. Additionally, I will check the seam on the rear, as this will also affect print quality. By taking the base of 0.01, going to add it against the 16 millimeters multiplied by the 1,000th of a millimeter step to achieve the new value of 0 0.026, which I will leave on for flow rate pass 2. Pass 2 will take the adjusted values that we had input from our flow 1 test results and will drop it down 9 modifiers. There is no risk of over extrusion as we initially chose the higher of the two values during our first pass. This is going to fine tune it to a point that we get a smooth surface and smooth perimeter, which I was able to find in the negative three value. Taking a look at negative two, I can see that there's still over extrusion on the outside perimeter. Taking a look at negative four, there's gaps between the lines. By taking the value of negative three, we are going to put it into our formula with a flow rate of 0.9723 we're going to multiply it by 100, minus 3 is our modifier, and then divide that all by 100. Our new value is going to be 0 0.9431, which I'll go ahead and input. After the updated value has been saved, we're ready to move on to the retraction test. This is going to see what the effective measurement needs to be to retract the filament to prevent stringing in between objects. For the direct drive unit, I leave the system settings of 0, 2 with a 0.1 millimeter step. Each of the lines in the towers is going to indicate the steps that are occurring as the towers print. What we're looking to achieve is the lowest point on this tower where the hot ends can transition from one side to the next without presenting any stringing. Taking a closer look at the tower, you can see that there is a string from 0.2 to 0.2 as it travels across but 0.3 to 0.3 doesn't provide any. With that being the lowest point, providing good quality, we're going to setting overrides in our filament settings, selecting length, and then putting 0.3. This will vary from machine to machine. After saving that, we can start moving on to the good stuff. Max flow rate and VFA are one of my favorites. And because I'm familiar with my machine and have a general idea, I'm going to up the max volumetric so that I'm between 10 and 50. With this setup, it's asking a little much, but I'd rather know where the ultimate point of failure is so I can dial it back and provide the highest max volume metric for my machine to print. Essentially what it does is it travels this pattern, getting faster and faster with the max volume metric flow rate adjusted higher and higher with each of the layers that is printed. Recognizing failure in the max volume metric test is easily apparent. You'll see that there are patches or openings in the print itself. By looking at the print as a whole, I'll be able to see where exactly that point of failure is through measurement. Up until this point, it was printing quite well. But you'll see that it starts to decline the higher it goes up. With the higher max volumetric flow rates exceeding what the printer is capable of, I'll get a measurement below where they started to fail checking all sides to make sure that that same measurement is going to work. An indicator of this, which you can check by the lines on the back or what would be the left side, can be matched against the flow rate in the slicer itself. But we're going to use the formula by taking the initially set base value of 10 millimeters per second cubed and adding it to the value of the 25 millimeter measurement multiplied by the one millimeter step. This will give me a value of 35, 
which I'll input in the max volumetric speed and save prior to continuing. And last, but definitely not least, is the vertical fine artifacts test. This will check and see if there's vertical lines through the entirety of your print as it spans a range of print speeds. For this ASA, I've elected to go with 150 starting up to 300 millimeters per second. The step will be 10 millimeters per second, which will be clearly defined by the notches on the outside edges of the print itself. Calibration process takes over two hours and under 100 grams of filament, but in turn, it provides you the peace of mind that your print quality will be good and there will be no waste of filament. Let's go ahead and send this off to print so that we can check the results and finalize our filament tuning. After the print is completed, we'll go ahead and perform an inspection on each of the walls with the varying radii. We want to look for the best quality and in the lower print speeds I do notice that there's VFA present. It was found that at approximately 220 millimeters per second, the quality was the best. I'll set this as my outer wall and run the inner walls as fast as 300 millimeters per second. The last step I'll take is inputting the vendor, who in this case was What's Kraken, so I can quickly access their storefront, know the price of a spool, and can estimate print costs. With this filament profile saved, at any time I choose to purchase another spool, I can quickly load it and get back to printing. I hope that this helped you understand the ins and outs of the Orca Slicer calibration and provided some clarity to the overall process. As a personal preference, I'll always throw a boron cube on as a test print to make sure that the values that we've input are going to provide the best quality in the print overall. With that, our boron cube is complete. I verified that everything that we changed does provide a better print quality, and I'm ready to move on to printing bigger and better things. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that we'll see you again. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to support the channel or future projects, feel free to check out the coffee link below. See you soon.